Hello and welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei, coming to you from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, the Fortune Global Forum is underway in Guangzhou, attracting hundreds of the world's top 500 companies to put their best foot forward. And China and Kyrgyzstan celebrate 25th anniversary of diplomatic relations capped by benefits of the Belt and Road Initiative potential. That's something Rosa Utenmayeva, a former president of Kyrgyzstan, talks about in our sit-down interview. We begin today's program with this year's Fortune Global Forum underway in Guangzhou until Friday. The forum is a platform for the world's top 500 companies, economists and scholars to compare notes and to share business wisdom. This year's forum with the theme, Openness and Innovation, Shaping the Global Economy, attracted around 1,000 government officials and senior business executives to broach new ideas on technology and global innovation. Before we go to our panelists, take a look at this. This is a list of the 50 smartest companies in the world compiled by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology this year. Nine Chinese firms are listed, and over half of them have presence in the city of Guangzhou. Guangzhou is pushing the IAB strategy, which stands for IT, artificial intelligence, and the biopharmaceutical industries. The highest listed Chinese firm, iFly Tech, is one of the world's top AI system developers. In 2015, the company set up its southern China headquarters in Guangzhou and has been working with the local government to enhance various services with AI. With our technologies, 30% of Guangzhou's mobile carrier and bank services are processed by AI. In the medical field, our AI can detect 94.1% of tuberculosis cases. AI doesn't function on its own. It's applied to existing industries. The company says Guangzhou, as a mega city, lays a good foundation for the application of AI. Guangzhou has a long history of business and commerce, and therefore it has extensive industry data and input resources in the fields of education and healthcare. Biopharmaceutical, according to the IAB strategy, is another important industry for Guangzhou. The city has one of China's largest pharmaceutical markets, and the industry grew by 17.8 percent last year. Behind me is the Guangzhou International Bio Island. This 240-square-meter industrial park is part of the local government's initiative to promote the biopharmaceutical industry in the city. The city is building more industrial parks like this for the industry. GE Healthcare is partnering with Guangzhou to establish a 350,000-square-meter bio-campus to support large-scale manufacturing of biopharmaceuticals in China. They are IAB vision, so if you look at information technology, AI, and also biotech, biotech is one of the three. Uh, I think from vision, long-term vision by the Guangzhou government align exactly what we wanted to accomplish for the biocampus uh, ecosystem. So I think this um, whole business model, it's a perfect example of private-public ship partnership. While biopharmaceutical is one of the fastest growing sectors globally, China only accounts for about 15 percent of the industry. Guangzhou's IAB strategy aims to join hands with the private sector to narrow that gap. For more on this year's Fortune Global Forum, we are joined in our Beijing studio, Liu Baocheng, who is the Dean of the Center for International Business Ethics from the University of International Business and Economics here in China. Welcome, sir. Also joining us in New York, we have Jeremy Kaplan, who is the Editor-in-Chief of Digital Trends. Welcome, Jeremy. And in London, we are joined by Joseph Maria Tassen, who is a partner of Pam. Gaia Finance Partners and also a contributing editor of Investments and Pensions Europe. Uh, gentlemen, I want to welcome the three of you. Let me begin with you, Professor Liu. It has been quite a while. Fortune Global Forum in China has not attracted that much attention. This year, it seems there's quite a spotlight. Yes. Uh, I think this is really a critical year where uh, we're going to see a lot of transformation technology that are really delivering the commercial results and uh, also that uh, the world is really uh, having a very large split on the policies behind uh, whether they're going to drive 
globalization mm. or whether they want to uh, roll back on uh, the domestic policy. And uh, also that uh, businesses are looking for a major turnaround at the crossroad. Right. So this is really an uh, important movement that mm. uh, we need to keep a close watch of what can be delivered at this forum. So a forum like this, particularly after the 19th Party Congress was just uh, concluded in China, could be a very important sign as to where things are. Mr. Kaplan, of course, you're being in the tech world. Will innovation really provide us with some of the solutions as a result of all of these dramatic changes around us? Yeah, technology and innovation are buzzwords that every company likes to put behind mm -hmm. themselves. Everyone likes to be associated with innovation. It's a great word. And increasingly here in the U.S., we've been seeing products coming across from China that are uh, hugely important and innovative. Um, we're talking about the forum over there. We have the, the CES forum here in the U.S., which increasingly has seen the presence of larger Chinese companies as well. So there's a very clear sense of all of these companies trying to em embrace globalization. But then, as the professor said, uh, we have this situation where government policies play a mm. huge factor. And it's going to be very interesting over the next couple of months and years to see how those policies play out in terms of the actual products that reach consumers on shelves and what becomes of the technology and the innovations that created those products themselves. Mm. A lot of economies need to update themselves uh, through innovation and some of the other means. Uh, Mr. Marriott Haslam, do you think there is a strong enough determination, though, including those uh, Fortune 500 companies that are coming to the Fortune Global Forum here in China? Are they really determined to have really a revolution of what they've been doing so far? I think the companies themselves are clearly trying to take advantage of innovation of trying to take account of automation, the internet, robotics, and so on. I think the more interesting question is what the impact has been and is going to be on the societies they're living in, and in particular, the uh, reaction we're seeing politically in terms of the changes in society arising from populist parties in Europe, the election of Donald Trump in the US, and so on. And I think that phenomenon mm. is something that companies are increasingly becoming aware of themselves. Decades ago, Professor Liu, the Fortune Global Forum first time came to China. It was a time in the middle of China's just opening up and reform. And everybody was amazed with all of these limousines and the global CEOs with their entourage and luxury hotels and everything. People were dazzled by that. But now, decades later, Chinese have seen enough material wealth the question is whether China will be able to still, with enough courage, open up its door, while at the same time be able to those very tough and painful reform within its own framework as well. So Professor Liu, what do you think is likely to happen after the 19th Party Congress? After all, China has already got quite a blueprint for itself. Well, it's not only courage, but also confidence, and behind of which is really the sophistication level of both policymakers and also the uh, uh, business leaders that are there. It's not only dealing with the Chinese domestic issues, mm. because uh, when China's door was first open, uh, we wanted to say, oh, okay, how much of foreign multinationals can really we attract to deliver uh, some of the technologies here in China mm. and to create employment. But right now, uh, the Chinese business leaders and policymakers are looking around the whole world for opportunities and also uh, to identify challenges and devise uh, yeah. strategies to address that. So it is still a very important event. And uh, uh, now it is really the companies that are really right. leading the technology and they are fueling not only the finance but also commercialization process well, for you know, all of them. You know, Professor Liu, at the time when China just opened up, it's kind of easy in a way in terms of what you need to do. You just follow others. That's Whatever true. worked, you adopt it and try to make sure it's going to work within your own framework. But now, China becomes the second largest economy in the world, very likely to be probably the largest in the world. Secondly, people look at you and talk about your model. Thirdly, you got a lot of things also within your country that 
an external pressure is not likely to be really solve the problem as it was decades ago when reform and open up it was just introduced. So things could be a little bit more challenging. And it probably needs more guts from within China itself in order to solve this problem. Professor Liu, so what could be this next uh, steps that we are talking about here, Professor Liu? I think the uh, good corporate governance is always there. And it's not only the courage now, mm. it's really the, the sophistication to follow the international rule and uh, also to build transparency yeah. in the operation and also to uh, look at the whole world at the uh, global map to uh, f to identify challenges and opportunities and of course you know to how the uh, 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 Chinese business leaders get really allied okay. with the policymakers in terms of their political orientation so that's also another very important point uh, we but need but to pay you know, attention to. Uh, the same thing I mean Mr. Mary Tatsan Decades ago, China was a newcomer into the World Trade Organization, and China was learning, a good student, shall I say. And now, decades later, that system has been challenged by some of the biggest uh, economic powers of the world. I mean, the international trading system, for example, WTO, globalization. So here's the thing, from a student to possibly you have to shoulder certain kinds of leadership role or certain kinds of responsibilities for carrying and innovating the system. This is going to be a very dramatic change in terms of role China is playing, Mr. Maria Tassan. So that dramatic change, what would that mean for many here in China and also people like you elsewhere? Well, I think the, the, the primary challenge for the world, for particularly for the developed world, arises from two fundamental economic forces which no one can control. One is the rise of emerging markets, of which China is clearly the, uh, the leader and, and the example, where the uh, living standards in China and in India 400 years ago, the living standards in China and India were comparable to those of Europe. And within 10, 20 years' time, the same may well be true again. Mm. So you're getting a leveling out of the playing field, of the disparity between developed markets and emerging markets. Yeah. And that's been driven by uh, a sucking out of middle class jobs from developed world. And the second also is the rise of automation of the internet and robotics, which again is destroying middle class jobs in Europe and the US. And those two forces are unstoppable. And so that gives rise to a lot of problems in Europe and the US. It's given rise to populist parties. It's given rise to the election of right. Donald Trump. But the, the issue is, now for the... But the question is, Mr. Mario, I, say, the issue now I for asked China, you earlier, that is, yeah, what kind of role China is likely to play uh, in the years to come? Uh, let me go to you, Mr. Kaplan, because earlier Mr. Merritt Hassan was also talking about it. Well, you know, technology is likely to be a threat to us, but we all know in any kinds of industrial revolution, technology is the thing that comes first, and then you have to change your system. Of course, some kinds of tragedy wars happen, but we want to avoid that this time. So, Mr. Kaplan, when you have the dramatic changes of the powers and the correlates with the dramatic changes of technologies, uh, how are different factors like companies, societies, governments play their roles? What are some of the previous lessons and experience that we can learn today, Mr. Kaplan? Well, it's very interesting to look at these two, these two different markets. Uh, w here in the U.S., we look at the Chinese market as an emerging market, and I think a lot of the largest Chinese companies feel exactly the same way about the U.S., that there's a huge opportunity to be gained over here. So we have these two giant superpowers looking at each other saying, how can we work effectively? If, if we're, is it competing or is it working or is it allowing opportunities for our largest companies to work in these different markets? Mm. So we have this interesting question of whether the government policies are going to be uh, or governments battling against each other even are going to be a real challenge here. Um, does Donald Trump's policy prevent a U.S. company from investing in China or at the same time does, a, does Donald Trump's policy prevent a Chinese company from taking out an investment in a U.S. company which it's, which it's hoping to do and which might fuel innovation in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, so I, I think what, what we're really looking to see out of this, this forum is you know, what sort of 
what's the net? What's the takeaway? Uh, do we have some decisive, uh, a decisive take on these policies that we that will guide investments and, mm. and future opportunities? That's right, Professor Liu. The same thing to you. I mean, earlier multinational companies, you know, those on the Fortune 500, are supposed to be pillars, but also they are also controversial because people think there are so much interests involved between them and the politics. But on the other hand, now you see some of the companies that are really transforming borders. Uh, for example, some of the tech companies. They are even bigger than some of the middle-sized country, some say. And yet, the traditional multilateral, the traditional uh, multilateral companies are becoming weaker because they're not anymore on the front line of innovation. So that is another transformation you are seeing in the landscape. It makes things ever trickier and yet, you could say there probably could be new opportunities for newcomers too, Professor Liu. Yes, they are uh, you know, structured companies. They uh, also have hurdles in bureaucracy and they, uh, they have built a quite a level of comfort with uh, what they have been doing and what they have succeeded. And that's the opportunity that provided for entrepreneurs and also for uh, the application of new technology, new business model. Mm. And so that, that's why the world is still moving. It's uh, uh, no one that is really a dominate uh, forever. So now, you know, Walmart used to be uh, a superpower, but now it's being uh, challenged, uh, you know, to a very tough uh, extent by the e-commerce uh, mm. you know, of the Alibaba model. And uh, now the uh, Facebook is also uh, challenging uh, all the big communication right. devices. So uh, this is how uh, exciting the world is going to get to be. Well, not only that, among the tech companies themselves, it could also be interesting. For example, Alibaba vis-a-vis -vis Amazon. Uh, for example, Google vis-a-vis -vis the so-called BAT here in China. The former is more on e-commerce, the latter is a competition, some say, and could be cooperation about AI, artificial intelligence. These are all dramatic changes in the landscape. How these companies are likely to interact with one another could be of great interest, to Mr. Kaplan. Uh, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and, and here we see the exact challenge. You know, um, with, with Google, it's been a real battle to get into the Chinese market at the same time that the Chinese government has been fueling companies that compete directly with Google. So as those companies have grown and become gigantic and look to, to enter into the U.S. market, uh, is that a fair form of competition? One of the, the key things that, that our companies, that the U.S. companies have been looking at. Mm. Um, if we can get back for a second to the, the cultural question, I think this is a very interesting one that we haven't delved into enough here. Um, looking at uh, the culture in Silicon Valley, one of the things that's, that's fueled the innovation we see over there is uh, individuals that have had great ideas and the ability to share them and work collaboratively, collaboratively together with or without support from the government. You've got two guys with a great idea, mm. sit down together at a bar, build a company, and boom, all of a sudden there's a billion dollar uh, valuation behind them. Well, not every uh, one to, of them to what successful, extent do we but have that? there are some that could be successful, <laughs> True. by the way. But so to what extent do we have that same environment being developed in China versus the government uh, fueling it with, with a, a vast amount of money, which is another great way to create innovation. It's just a different model. Mm. It's interesting to look at. So it is a debate about models, <laughs> Professor Liu. Absolutely. I think now, uh, particularly for China, uh, a couple of years ago, people built factories and found a foreign buyer and make stuff and sell it, and that was all. But right now, capital is playing a very important role to support mm. efficiency and skill economy in China. And uh, then the outbound investment is becoming uh, so much a driver for China. It's not, on, not only there to uh, absorb the technology, but really to get closer to the consumers and to also to participate so closely in the entire value chain. So that's the change that China is experiencing in a very positive way. Mm. Not to mention, Mr. Maria Tazam, that uh, there are emerging economies developing the countries that are being developing in their own way. And that seems to be quite a success so far vis-a-vis -vis what you have just been describing and analyzing about some of the European countries, for example, or some parts of the United States. Ms. Maria Tazan, you know, will these kinds of businesses exchanges be able to help us from outside the circle, 
clarify some of the ideas that have worked and be able to jump on something that could be of potential for not just the business community, but also the society as a whole. And meanwhile, how to make sure institutional building so that the business community will not only serve their own purposes, but also the general good, particularly at the time of dramatic technological transformation. Mr. Maria Tassa, I know it's a big question, but I think this is really worth discussing. Absolutely, I think all companies ultimately need to see their role as having some societal benefit now, I was listening to Al Gore last week at a conference, and he was saying sustainability is the most exciting investment challenge humanity has ever seen. The ability to create companies that help society actually live for in a world of, re of limited resources, mm. of issues to do with global warming, all sorts of things. Companies have to play a part in this. And to, to their credit, many companies are taking advantage of opportunities like uh, uh, green technology, global warming, how can you actually find ways to alleviate that. China's actually been very active and it's very gratifying to see the, the lead China has been taking on some of the issues associated with global warming, for mm. example, where there's been huge emphasis on electric cars, right. on green energy, and so on. Very interesting. So I think it, it is a fascinating area, it's an important area, and it's also possibly, many people argue, it is an existential issue for the future of mankind. How can the corporate world actually focus more on creating a better society right. as well as pure profits? Exactly. And, and that's also, that's a great thing to talk about when you, when you talk about where the government is spurring the investment. Uh, artificial intelligence is this buzzword that we talk about in technology all the time. Artificial intelligence is going to shape everything and rechange how we do everything. And it might make our lives a little bit better, but isn't necessarily fueling the, the, the better society that you were talking about just now, Joseph. To what extent does the government fuel investments in something like that, which is good for business, versus fueling investments in uh, cleaner energy, in green cars, electric cars, that sort of thing. And, and here's where China has a real chance to, to shape the dialogue, I think. Mm. I think everybody has a chance to shape a dialogue. Well, as long as the parties want to make their effort, we have to wrap up for today. Thank you so much for your contribution. Liu Baocheng, Joseph Kaplan, and Joseph Mary Tassan. Really appreciate gentlemen for being with us. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on our program. After two and a half decades, China and Kyrgyzstan are ready to turn a new leaf in diplomatic relations with the Belgian world. I will ask Yosa Utsunbayeva, a former president of a dear distance, what that meant for the country. In this episode of Travelogue, we continue along the Pearl River and share with you Xunwu. We discover rock temples and a rock trade while on a grueling journey in search of something very small but very special. Join us to find out what it is, plus more. We have come a long way. Changes happen, and fast. From all corners, different lives, voices, and visions. Encouraged to think, enlightened to change. World Insight with Tian Wei go beyond the headlines. You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei, coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. Since the establishment of diplomatic relations between China and Kyrgyzstan 25 years ago, both sides have improved the bilateral ties while upholding the principle of mutual respect and win-win cooperation. Remarkable progress has also been achieved since China and Kyrgyzstan carried out cooperation under the Belt and Road Initiative more than three years ago. So how can interaction with close neighbors bring tangible benefits to 
both sides. And how shall we draw inspirations from this bilateral relations? Join me in our studio. We are honored to have Rosa Utumbayeva, who is former president of Kyrgyzstan. Madam President, what a mm -hmm. pleasure to see you in Beijing. Thank you. Thank Last you. time I see you, it was uh, on a beach resort full of sunshine and here just winter time. Exactly. <laughs> but there's a lot of excitement in the air because of the Belt and Road Initiative. I understand, Madam President, mm -hmm. you met with the Chinese president recently mm -hmm. and got to know better about this BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. How much potential really is there mm -hmm. for your country mm -hmm. on this path? Uh, this is uh, really uh, such a serious uh, global initiative which has a uh, um, very solid impact on neighbors of uh, China. Mm. Uh, my country has a thousand kilometer border, 1,000 kilometer border with China. And uh, uh, today when we are talking about the revival of the Silk Road, Great mm. Silk Road, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, it is the uh, Belt and Road Initiative in mm. some way. Yes. And, uh, we are uh, um, uh, we, we worked on the strategy how to uh, uh, implement uh, this uh, belt and road so uh, my country is eager to get uh, access to the sea because we are landlocked country and uh, uh, via those railroads which will go uh, over the body of the country mm. will get uh, such uh, access. Uh, um, so far, uh, no concrete project uh, has been done mm. in my country, but uh, next door, Kazakhstan, they uh, started to do a lot of uh, things, and I was in 2015 in Chuncin, mm -hmm. and I have seen with my own eyes this route which comes from Chuncin all the way through Russia, uh, Belarus, uh, Poland, and uh, uh, reaches uh, uh, Duisburg in right. Germany. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I know that uh, there are goods going of, uh, uh, on this uh, road. Um, the road which will be, uh, which will go, which will pass my country will, um, Con, uh, connects uh, my country uh, with the uh, Persian uh, ports. Right. Uh, so this uh, the transit will go uh, via Kyrgyzstan towards uh, to Iran and further up. That's very exciting, but the question is connectivity in the region is not an easy thing. As you said, you've seen your neighbors, Kazakhstan has been developing quite much in that mm -hmm. regard. What does it take for Kyrgyzstan to catch up? Uh, what kind of the level of trust that you need to have with China and some of the neighboring countries? Uh, for example, with Kazakhstan to be better, better linked with one another. Uh, Kazakhstan, we are uh, very uh, close culturally, historically, right. almost the same language uh, and uh, uh, Kazakhstan is certainly in avant-garde of the development, economical development. Mm. Uh, they are uh, developing much faster than others. Uh, uh, they are advantages and uh, uh, so far, uh, I guess, uh, we'll try to catch up this. I see. But you know, Madam President, there are many different kind of platforms and mechanisms that existing in the region. For example, the Eurasian Economic Community is one of those that Kyrgyzstan is part of. So uh, as a result of that, there are some common initiatives that you as a member of Kyrgyzstan is to fulfill with. Mm -hmm. And how do you see that is likely to become part of you? Well, at the same time, you participating in Belt and Road Initiative. Even though China and Russia, which is on the Belt and Road Initiative, the other is on the Eurasian Corridor, mm -hmm. actually believe that one another could cooperate and complement. But for a country mm -hmm. that's in the region, what is it like? Well, first of all, I want uh, to stress that uh, Kyrgyzstan was uh, probably the first uh, in Central Asia country who became a member of WTO. So mm. we, we've been- World uh, Trade Organization, yes, yes exactly. Indeed. And uh, uh, we, we joined uh, last year 
to this Eurasian Economic Alliance, which uh, combines five countries of the former Soviet Union, mm -hmm. headed by Russia. So, and uh, uh, this initiative with the Belt and Road, uh, the, this is global initiative, by the way, it's not a regional, right, initiative, and aims uh, the whole globe, uh, uh, goes uh, to all uh, directions. But in this region, you are right, uh, we have uh, a number of those uh, of uh, such uh, uh, economical alliances, uh, which uh, agenda of which is uh, something different sometimes. Uh, but economically, I guess uh, I don't see any problem with uh, the uh, ro of, um, Belt and Road, and uh, especially uh, they are uh, much uh, smaller such economical and financial institutions mm. which uh, some countries uh, for them this is sort of obstacle um, at the same time new initiatives came alongside of the, with right. uh, uh, belt and road this is uh, uh, bank uh, uh, no financial institutions like uh, silk road right. and uh, asian infrastructural uh, investment, firm, bank. investment bank so I mean, uh, look, uh, uh, each of them, uh, I, I, I'm sure that, that uh, experts, they know that each of them, they have own area of responsibility, mm. own mandate, and uh, um, uh, if uh, politics uh, come to the point, then probably sometimes it, it uh, turns uh, a bit mm. attention, but otherwise, economically, all of us, we are trying to, to, yeah. to move. Talking about politics, uh, Madam President, uh, your country, together with some of the other neighboring countries, have gone through quite some ups and downs politically. At this point, which stage do you think you are, Central Asian countries? Well, from your understanding, of course, now you're far away from politics. Mm -hmm. You're working on mm -hmm. your own and some mm -hmm. of the important the social initiatives. So I guess you could comment about that. Which stage are you in now? All of us, we are... Uh uh, successors of the Soviet Union and uh, uh, we have celebrated our quarter of uh, century independence this year mm -hmm. so uh, for 25 years old uh, of matured uh, states mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I must uh, uh, tell you that uh, uh, development uh, and politically as entities uh, we are uh, a bit different from each other, so. Already. Uh, yeah, quite different. Uh, uh, Central Asian uh, countries, uh, the, all of us, we are members of the Organization of Security and Cooperation of Europe. Uh, a lot of uh, efforts has been done in our democratical developments, uh, uh, but um, today, uh, in fact, we see that uh, um, uh, some countries uh, pursued only economical agenda and uh, put aside all these other matters and uh, uh, they look different. Mm. But uh, agenda is really to make uh, life of their nations uh, prosper, better, right. and uh, certainly results, of, you would see some results, uh, of course, in, in these countries. 25 years been uh, troubled, difficult years. Yes. Uh, after the collapse of USSR, we have passed uh, through uh, such a, uh, not an easy uh, time, there. turbulent years. Uh, we're supposed to learn uh, market economy, uh, democracy, and uh, uh, sort of uh, demand from the world uh, was very hard towards to us. Uh, but in 25 years, we learned something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do believe that uh, with such a new knowledge and baggage of uh, skills and knowledge, will probably go now much easier. Madam President, you know, I know you personally, politically, have gone through a lot. Mm -hmm. At times, you even become a controversial figure in your country, politically mm -hmm. speaking. But now you have survived it and thrive mm -hmm. in a different way, on a different cause. How do you look at the life of politicians? Now you are out of politics these days. And what do you make of the past 25 years for you to know yourself better and know your country better? Uh, we have gone through this uh, 
a very uneasy time of privatization of public goods. Mm -hmm. So when we, uh, for after the collapse of USSR, a time came to privatize everything. And uh, oh, it, it has been done very quickly away. So in order not to turn back to socialism, mm -hmm. And forcefully, and uh, uh, let's say 70-80% uh, of public goods came uh, to the hands of 5-10%. Others became very poor. Yes. I'm sort of uh, with the socialist big background the person. Uh, I thought that uh, this is unfair, unjust. And uh, I stay on this position until today in the way that uh, I do believe uh, that uh, uh, it should be quality. Uh, if, uh, we should overcome poverty. Mm. This is the agenda, for example, still in my country. Mm. So that was my background. That was my aim also. Uh, I came uh, as leader of opposition party, Social Democrats, uh, uh, to the revolution of 2010, when uh, uh, the uh, president uh, of those days, Bakiev, he was uh, 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 he, he was overthrown by mass uh, uprising of people. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, people couldn't uh, uh, stay anymore like that. So, and uh, I do believe that uh, you should uh, be very uh, poli a politician mm -hmm. uh, should be very firm to his principles. Uh, he should dev be devoted to the ideals and to the uh, aims of his nation. Mm. Uh, I do believe that, uh, especially now, reading report of uh, President Xi Jinping, when he's talking about uh, the uh, socialism, mm. about, uh, he said, uh, uh, China has passed parliamentary uh, life uh, uh, governance, presidential, constitutional monarchy. So uh, the most successful it was socialism. Mm. To China. Social, yeah, to China, yes. Yeah. Socialism, which brought prosperity to the people, and so they don't uh, have uh, any more uh, such a needs like bread or cloth, mm. uh, clothing. So That is I mean, China's own model. China's and now own China model. is in a socialism with Chinese characteristics in exactly. the new era. So exactly. it seems that there are a lot of different debates inside different countries about how to improve right. their system. You certainly have that too. But as a women leader too, this is uh, something not easily found in many countries as the women leader, as the top leader of the country. So Madam President, I also want to you as, ask you as a woman as mm. well, what, does those, what did those difficult days the challenges you faced, and usually as a politician, has to be faced those challenges alone at the end of the day, has taught you about yourself, about the people around you, about the real essence of your country, and about what a woman is like. It was very difficult days. Uh, the uh, power uh, fell down. Uh, the president who left uh, the power here killed about 100 people. And uh, power was uh, in this, uh, um, just la laid down in the bloodshed. And uh, in that moment, we took the responsibility. My interim government, which we set up immediately, we uh, gave the uh, such an um, oath to people that uh, uh, will uh, uh, put constitution to the table of people, will uh, bring up again uh, each uh, part of the power, like uh, parliament, like uh, uh, for president. Mm. So um, uh, it was a very turbulent time. And uh, How did I was you... not hysterical. Mm. I was very calm. I was very cold in the sense uh, pragmatic, rational. And uh, I must tell you that when people say that, oh, women, they are weak uh, part and they scared, they don't do. No, women are like mothers of the house. Women are very concentrated on the high uh, priorities, on agenda. 
none of the men uh, have seen me in, uh, in panic. Uh, I took a lot of responsibility in those difficult days. Madam President, before we go, I want to ask you a visionary question. Mm. There are a lot of debates these days in the world about, you know, what kind of approach. Maybe we only deal with bilaterally. Some say regionalization, globalization is still the way to go, as probably China believes. And some also suggest, that, well, our interests come first, and only our interests come first. Madam President, what is exactly your vision where the world is going? First of all, I would praise uh, this position of globalization. Look, in such a world, uh, uh, we are approaching uh, of, uh, to the 20th uh, uh, of 21st century, right? And uh, how you would uh, now get uh, uh, introvert uh, and uh, state that uh, my country is first. And uh, so nationalism and populism, which are uh, the, uh, such a strides of this mm -hmm. uh, new politics uh, it doesn't work in in the case of my country and uh, the, these are not uh, mottos uh, uh, of my belief uh, uh, regarding politics concrete politics certainly you should work with the frame of uh, regional organization no doubt about this because you can't go straight uh, from your village to the globe so uh, I think uh, uh, we would still work uh, within Shanghai organization, mm -hmm. within uh, uh, yeah, Shanghai cooperation, cooperation organization. organization, within our uh, uh, Eurasian uh, for economical alliance and so on. So regionalism uh, for, uh, with this regard, uh, this is uh, normal stuff. And uh, uh, I would uh, uh, insist that uh, globalization this is our future and so this is the future of our children and we must uh, make sure that uh, in their uh, education mm -hmm. in their learning the world our children should be open and ready to be citizens of the world what a pleasure having you madam president uh, rosa utmayeva the third president of the kyrgyz republic mm. Thank you so much for being with us. All the best. Thank you. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Cineweibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.